Great. Uh, first, thanks to the organizer for inviting me. My name is Alvaro Videla. I come from Uruguay, from South America. For the Premiership fans, we don't only export football players. There is people also there that think and work and so on. Uh, I, I live in Switzerland right now. Before, I used to live in China. And yeah, before in Uruguay, so I've been kind of all over the place. And yeah, this talk is metaphors we compute by. If you are really hungry, you can just go and have your food because the transcript is online already and freely <laughs> available. So don't waste your, your time on that. Anyway, um, the year is 1980, one year before I was born. And a great book came out. It was called Metaphors We Live By, written by George uh, Lakoff and Mark Johnson. You can imagine that this book was so influential that now there is metaphors we cook by, metaphors we I don't care what by. So my talk title is, isn't that original at all. So what's the idea behind this book? The idea is that um, metaphor isn't just a matter of poetry and rhet rhetorical uh, flourish. Before, mostly based on uh, Arist Aristoteles, people think like metaphor is only used in literature. But what they started getting into is like, no, they actually affect how we think, how we behave on the, in the world, and so on. And they started uh, studying language and metaphors because these, uh, these two guys, they are cognitive scientists and linguists. So they wanted to understand how the brain works, but you can't kind of pick a brain and see what's inside. I mean, it's kind of illegal. Um, so yeah, they say, OK, let's study it through a proxy, which is language, because that's uh, how the brain kind of show how it works. So they say that metaphors detect how we think, how we behave, how we perceive, and how our conceptual system is built. And they give in an early example on the first chapter, which they say we understand argument as war. So the metaphor is argument is war. We have this metaphor in our brains, and that's how we come when we, we have a discussion with somebody. Because of that, we have a whole lot of sentences like, your claims are indefensible, or he attacked every weak point in my argument, or I demolished his argument, or I never won an argument with him, or his criticisms were right on target. So the point is, like, because we understand argument as war, then we construe our arguments around all this uh, mechanism of war. So they wonder what would happen if for us argument was dance, like we need to cooperate to achieve the same goal, for example. But no, we like wars. So <laughs> English even has two, wor two words for it, like fight and battle and so on, because of the, the several uh, invaders you had here. So it's really cool to fight, right? <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, anyway, I see that you're probably not convinced. So when you're not convinced, let's talk about politics, because that's uh, what everybody likes to do, right? <laughs> So there is an article by the BBC, which is how metaphors shape women's lives. You can find it online, but it has a very interesting quote that says um, that there was an experiment about how metaphors can act, um, affect the way people see crime and how they will solve the crime problem in their cities. So they had the same data, all the same, except the way they shape or they frame the, the problem. To some students, they told them that um, crime was a wild beast preying on the city. To others, that it was a virus infecting the city. The students that were um, in the beast, they wanted shale and punishment and so on. Just because they were primed, let's say, with that story around crime. So, of course, everybody in that group say, no, I was just looking at the figures, and based on these figures, I wanted to find these solutions, but no. But anyway, you are probably not convinced still, and we work in a very interesting industry where being the macho guy is like, woo, I'm, I'm so cool. No, you're not. Uh, there is this book called Feminism Confront Technology, which I discovered like two weeks ago, and it's really interesting from the 90s. And they talk like how in the 80s, language 
shape the way we understand computer programming on a way to say, okay, women cannot do it anymore because I'm a mega macho and everything that is hard and so on is, is for myself and these people don't belong here. So there is a whole study by this researcher Coburn. Um, so yeah, go read it if you want. That book is also great. He arrived yesterday at home, so I'm not going to tell you where I got the screenshot, but you can probably guess. Um, it was uh, a Russian website. <laughs> anyway, uh, so you're probably not convinced still. So let's talk about human resource management. We all love that word, right? When you think that humans are resources, then you think that programmers can be replaced. Then you think that if you hire uh, nine women, you get the baby in a month and whatever it goes. Uh, and yeah, people, we are not resources. But if, if our companies keep thinking of us that way, with that metaphor, then we know what happens in, in software management, right? And the final one, trigger warning, there is a conference that luckily doesn't happen this side of the Atlantic, that they like to invite Nazis to give like uh, speeches on their keynotes. So when they wanted to argue why they did that, the organizer wrote a blog post saying wrestling with inclusion at whatever the name of the conf. And I wonder immediately, wrestling, why are you wrestling with inclusion? Why don't you cooperate with inclusion? I don't know. But anyway, those are my examples from outside the field of computers. Now, let's talk about computers. You probably know that computers, uh, if you've seen the film or read the book, computers were people that they were doing calculations by hand for engineers. And because at some point we had this uh, amazing invention that did automatic calculations, our automatic computer, as it was called, we dropped the automatic, we just kept the computer. Our own field starts from a metaphor. We didn't know how to explain that thing that was uh, humming there, and now, okay, we have these people doing something similar. Let's use that name and, and try to work with that. Because uh, metaphors, they enable uh, understanding. That's why we use metaphors for almost everything uh, in our daily language. The most basic example is this one from Shakespeare, or Francis Bacon, I don't know what's the, who's the actual, <laughs> let's put a, a conspiracy theory here. <laughs> so he says that Juliet is like the sun, right? And we understand that Juliet for Romeo is probably the source of life. Without Juliet, Romeo will die, I don't know. But we don't understand from this metaphor Juliet gave me skin cancer, right? <laughs> like, we managed to see uh, what things from the sun apply to Juliet and which one doesn't or don't. I never know which one to use in English. So, there is a book called The Geometry of Meanings by Peter Gardenfors, which is semantics based on conceptual spaces. Cool. And in this book, they say, like, metaphorical mappings preserve the cognitive topology of the source domain in a way that is consistent with the inherent structure of the target domain. So metaphors, they transfer information from one conceptual domain to another. And what is transferred is a pattern rather than domain-specific information. You see things in the sun, and with that, you understand what Juliet is for Romeo, not that she's incandescent and shooting atomic bombs every, every second, right? Maybe, I don't know. Uh, so a metaphor can thus be used to identify a structure in a domain that would not have been discovered otherwise. That's how metaphors work in a ring. And I think, for me, this is like this graph is a morphism problem. I think this is what our brain is doing constantly, like seeing patterns in one thing applying it and explaining it in, a, in, a, in another. So for all these mathematicians, probably our brain already solved that problem. I don't know. I guess it doesn't for big graphs, graphs but whatever. But this translation or transportation of meaning is how metaphors create new knowledge. Actually, the word metaphor in Greek means to transport or something like that. And you can see vans, vans on the street 
with the word metaphor in Greek, of course, but it's not like they are selling metaphors. They are just <laughs> moving things around. <laughs> anyway, so yes, metaphors help us to create new knowledge, but they also uh, obscure understanding. And think about the telegraph, not the newspaper, by the way. But have you wondered why the telegraph, the newspaper, is called the telegraph? Transmits information. Sorry? Carries and transmits information. No. <laughs> I mean, vielleicht, maybe, but uh, in in. If the telegraph would have been founded today, it was probably called machine learning, AI, or any buzzword of the day. The telegraph, as an invention, was new back then, was a way to transfer news very fast, so let's call ourselves telegraph, because we are the cool kids in the block, basically. But anyway, why I bring up the telegraph? Telegraph means far writing. And the, the initial attempt to create a telegraph was to have something not like a hand moving, but something like we'll uh, move levers and type things or something like that, because we couldn't get away from the metaphor, because the metaphor in this case was obscuring the, the meaning. So Nicholas Carr, in his book, The Shallows, he says that sometimes our tools do what we tell them to. Other times, we adapt ourselves to our tools' requirements. And metaphors, in a way, are the tools of thought. So if we get too attached to the metaphor, we are probably losing a lot. In software development, there has been a lot of argument about whether we should use master-slave uh, in, in data replication. I totally think we shouldn't, uh, because this means a very bad thing for a lot of people in, the, in this world. So what's the point of not changing that? But we just got so attached to that thing that uh, we are uh, slow in our comprehension and, and so on. Then, metaphors and code. There is a great paper which is called What a Programmer Does. This paper you can find it on Donald uh, Knut's archive. Um, it's not known who is the author. Donald Knut is guessing who is the author, but they have no clue. But the point is, it's the best unknown paper I ever read. Um, and one thing that the author says is that to program is to write to another programmer about our solution to a problem. <coughs> that is what a program is. It's how we tell in another person, this is how we solve the problem. Maybe that person is our future selves. Maybe that person is our colleagues. But I firmly believe that we program for humans. The computer is just a machine that is fast at executing that algorithm. But honestly, I don't care about computers. You can say, yeah, but you need to optimize the code and blah. Yeah, I know you have to optimize the code for the architecture that we have, depending on if you are on the JVM, Erlang, or whatever. Yeah, for sure, at some point, we have to get there. But uh, at a very high level, the first interface we have with the program, which is the code, I think should be easier to understand. When we go deeper into the program, OK, maybe there we optimize or not. Who knows? And there is this other quote um, from the Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs that says, programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. I think that is also a really important quote. I think we spend most of the time just reading programs, trying to fix a bug, trying to solve how, understand how is it working, and, and so on. So how are our programs built? How do we tell a good story in our programs? In programming, we have types. Types are the characters that tell the story of our programs. And I'm talking here at types in the sense of Haskell types or Scala. I'm more like in what uh, Barbara Liskov says in programming with abstract data types. Back in the 70s, she had to find programmers to tell them, look, you need to use abstraction. You need to organize your code. Back in the day, that was something like, mm -mm -mm, I just want my go-to there, please. Don't take my go-to from me. OK, so this kind of data types, like when you have a, a queue, a stack, a user, whatever it means in your program, that is what's telling the story of your program and explaining what we are trying to solve, let's say. If we remove the types, we just have operations on stream of bytes. Let's go back to binary code and be the von Neumann that say no real programmer use a, 
uh, assembler or whatever he was mad at back in the day. I don't know. But I think we should use types. I mean, not types, but types in the sense of Barbara this code. And why does it matter? <clears throat> because when you choose the right data structure, you amplify the meaning of your program, the explanation or explanatory po power of your program. Just imagine that you have a set of users or a, a, a bunch of users that you need to, to contain in some data type. We could store this in an array, that's fine, but in the requirements, we know that users are unique. So then when you store them in a set, you are already telling me, look, there is something about this collection that you should know in this case that they have to be unique, whether they're users, products, whatever they are. A linked list, they tell us how the data can be traversed. A queue has the notion of uh, first come, first served. The reverse will be the stack. O all that you put on a stack or a queue in a linked list or even a set can be backed by an array. Could be even just a plain array exposed to the upper layer of your code. But which one will tell more clear what is going on in the program? If you have a first in, first out thingy, that will be uh, a queue, for example. So a program explanatory power is a measure of its own elegance. And data structure, they have uh, explanatory power. And when we choose the right uh, data structure, the right metaphor, we can get cognitive leaps into the problem we are trying to, to solve. Think about task scheduling. You have uh, jobs that they need to process, to be processed as they come in. Depending on the order, we, we go after them, and it's really cumbersome to talk like this, or we just can talk about having a queue, and when we have a queue, we understand that this problem belongs to queue in theory. We have the whole queue in theory for free, just because we understood the right metaphor for that problem. Ne then, we want to get from point A to point B in a city. Route planning, we can start, yeah, I could, I don't know, do something there with the streets, or I can understand this is a graph theory problem. The graph is the right representation, the right metaphor for that city, is the, the equivalence of that city. But if you know, if you have a graph representing London, you know that graph doesn't represent every single detail of London. That's the point where the metaphor stops, like just transfer a pattern from one domain to another, but not the whole thing. That's what uh, Borges used to say, like you cannot have a map that has every single detail of the city because it was the point of that map. A map should be like an abstraction that uh, lets you get into or, or have explanatory power into what you are dealing with. Same here with metaphors, in this case, graph theory. Then another cool one comes from data database replication. Back in the 80s, they, at Xerox, I think, they were trying to solve how to replicate data in a reliable way. And they come up with the idea of uh, rumor mongering. The South American telenovela way. That's what we understand. Uh, so with rumor mongering, they say, OK, this computer tells this other two computers that there is new data, this one to other two, and so on. Cool, we understand, easy to explain, hard to work with. But then they realized that this a more apt metaphor would have been epidemics like how to spread epidemics in a population is similar on how to spread uh, information on a computer cluster. And here's where the police comes to get me. So please, I hope I, I'm lucky they don't have weapons here, so I'm, I could be okay. But anyway, the, this book, The Mathematical Theory of Epidemics from around the 50s, they have it all this theory for free because they understood that what they were considering rumor mongering was actually epidemics, and then they could prove mathematically that their algorithms will, were going to spread the information as they expected. So it's really, really important to be able to find the right metaphor for our current uh, problem. So is everything a metaphor? I don't believe you. OK, let's read something from distributed system uh, literature. Whenever nodes need to agree on a common value, we start a consensus algorithm to decide on a value that's usually a leader process that takes care of making the final decision based on the votes it has received from its peers. 
Nodes communicate sending messages over a channel, which might get congested due to too much traffic. This could create an information bottleneck with queues at each end of the channels uh, backing up. These bottlenecks might render one or more nodes unresponsive, causing network partitions. Is a process that's taking too long to respond dead. We won't know unless we set a timeout, blah, blah, blah. I could keep going. Just do the exercise, next book you grab, next newspaper article, mark all the metaphors. And there are a lot of them. Um, and to kind of end this uh, presentation, let's talk about buzzwords and containers. Everybody loves containers. And why I bring this up? Because I think containers, to name an example, they brought a whole bunch of metaphors that make it really easy to understand the idea. Maybe you don't like it. Maybe you hate containers. I sometimes kind of get mad at Docker. But uh, probably every day. But <laughs> they have this standard way of being containers. They can be shipped anywhere. They fit on train, ships, trucks. They can be stacked. They can be reused. But we understand that we don't uh, wait till a ship is uh, full with containers to do a deployment. We, we get that that part of the metaphor doesn't apply to computer containers. But because this is so easy to grasp, this idea, I think it's one of the reasons why this became so spread. Because uh, JBM, in a way, had containers. Erlang kind of has containers. And there had been this idea of packing up things for re repeatable deployment since uh, virtual machines, I don't know, whatever. Another point that maybe doesn't apply to the metaphor, but you can, this is my free startup idea. That's uh, Haley, the astronomer, he also created a diving bell which was a thing that he used to go underwater to rescue ship uh, wreckage. So at some point, the container industry will start to crumble, and you will have your HaleyBell.io, and maybe that's your, your next startup. I don't know. Nerd joke. Anyway. Uh, then microservices. When I was reading this uh, paper, I was all the time, every paragraph, I've been a, a, an Erlang developer for too long, so the brain damage is already there. Uh, it's a literally Stockholm syndrome. If you want to have it, it's with Erlang. It's come from Stockholm, from Sweden. So if you are really there, Erlang. But anyway, I was reading every paragraph, and I was all the time, but this is Erlang. This is Erlang. Like, Erlang can do this already, right? Erlang, why? And they brought all these things like of decentralized governance, monolith versus microservice. That's a really cool metaphor, monolith. Like if you throw that in a discussion, are you building a monolith now? Okay, and it's like the, the calling the German guy or Austrian guy into a discussion, you win the argument. Okay, now you throw monolith, it's the same. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to name the guy, but you probably know who I'm talking to. It's not Mozart, if you were wondering. <laughs> and um, yeah. We have isolation, collaborations, small is better, big is cumbersome, David versus Goliath, yeah, microservices, they are really cool. And when I was reading that, I say, okay, Erlang, right? The last part of, the, of that paper says, in another direction, one could argue that microservices are the same thing as the Erlang programming model, but applied to an enterprise application context. Thing is, this is like a note at the bottom of the page that is probably not even fitting on your browser, so, but it's there. But I ask myself, what is Erlang's elevator pitch? How are you going to sell me Erlang in 20 seconds? Are you going to talk about the actor model? Like, why do I even care about actors? I don't know. I think um, Erlang loses there. It's, um, it's, it's really hard to sell, to explain, because the metaphor of this actor thingy, I don't know. It has some really good things, like how you have thousands of processes, how you supervise them, and so on, which make application really easy to, to, to manage. But if you want to bring beginners into the platform, probably not sure they have the, the best thing. Then 
it seems that I missed with my slides. But the next slide I was going to talk about uh, RabbitMQ. I also was a, a RabbitMQ core developer. And when I was presenting RabbitMQ, um, people told me, yeah, but that's like a job server. No, it's not a job server. Excuse me, right? Well, actually. And the, <laughs> the thing is, it's a queue server. And messages are like a higher abstraction than jobs. A message could be a job. So when you tell me, is that just a job server? No, it's much more than that. Excuse me. You know? And <laughs> no, that's wrong. Because at least with the job metaphor, everybody understands that. Everybody can work with that. Everybody can build knowledge in that. Everybody can start using RabbitMQ. And then we tell them when it's going to crash, let's say. But <laughs> I mean, what we tell them exactly what is, is Rabbit. Like, yeah, you have a like, lot of routing patterns, like in messaging, and I don't know how many other things. But yeah, it's really important to understand the power of whatever metaphor you're using to explain your message, let's say. And finally, the conclusion is, I think, we should master the art of uh, metaphor selection. We need to get uh, people to understand things, then explain them how things actually work. That's my RabbitMQ slide, cool. <laughs> and uh, as a conclusion, we need to learn to amplify meaning. And at the end of the day, the program we write is the metaphor for the solution we found. Is it easy to understand? Then, good. It's not easy to understand? Let's keep digging, let's keep refactoring in the same way a writer will do. References, a lot to read. By the way, if you're trying to follow me on Twitter, don't do it. Your Amazon account will collapse because I always post in books, so be careful. Anyway, thank you very much.